Good evening, everybody. We're delighted to be with you tonight to share a little music and a little information about Engelbert Humperdinck's opera Hansel and Gretel, which the Washington National Opera is producing as our first family opera in the Terrace Theater. It goes up December 21st and runs for four performances through December 23rd. Now, if you know the story of Hansel and Gretel, you know that one of the morals is that when the chips are down, the best friend you could have is your brother or your sister, right? This was true no less for the composer Engelbert Humperdinck because the one work that uh, made his name, for which we really remember him today, was inspired by his own sister. And I'll tell you how that happened. Humperdinck was a talented kid. Uh, his parents wanted him to go into architecture, but it became clear that music was his bent, and so he went through conservatories uh, in Cologne, eventually in Munich. He won a bunch of prizes. They sent him to Italy to study. In Italy, he met uh, the composer who was the leading light of the German opera world at the time. That is, of course, Richard Wagner. They met in Naples. Uh, and Wagner was so impressed with this young man that he asked him to be his assistant. He took him to Bayreuth, his home theater, and Humpertink was his assistant on the first production of Parsifal. Among other things, he was responsible for copying out the score. But this wasn't all launching Humperdinck on a big career as a composer. After working with Wagner, he had several teaching posts, he did some writing, but nothing was really making his career take off until in 1890, his sister, a woman named Adelheid Wette, who had kids, asked him to arrange some folk songs for a little uh, concert version of Hansel and Gretel that she and her kids were putting on at home for family entertainment. He arranged four folk songs from it, and it was immediately smitten with the subject. Uh, those those four folk songs eventually were developed into a zingspiel, that's sort of a musical comedy, uh, musical numbers connected with dialogue. And in 1893, finally, with his sister's help writing the libretto, um, he turned it into a full-fledged opera, which was an immediate success. Uh, it attracted all the most famous names in German music. The, the premiere was conducted by Richard Strauss. Uh, the premiere in Hamburg was conducted by Gustav Mahler. Uh, and all the great Wagnerian conductors of the time also vied to have a hand in producing it. So it was, a, it was an immediate hit. It was the big hit of his career. He never really did anything else that equaled it. But uh, if you're going to write one really good piece, this was a really good one piece to write. Now, uh, Adelheid Wette based her story uh, for Hansel and Gretel on the story by the brothers Grimm. Uh, how many of you all have read the story of by the Brothers Grimm? Yeah, some of you. So you remember the original version is, well, Grimm. Um, the, uh, in the original version, the family doesn't have enough to eat, and so the mother contrives to take Hansel and Gretel out into the forest and abandon them there. And they find their way back once, because Hansel leaves, Hansel leaves a little trail of white pebbles. The second time, she wises up and doesn't let him take any pebbles in his pockets. And she abandons them out there again. Um, and that's when they meet the witch and everything like that. The mother in uh, Miss Vettis' libretto for the opera, Hansel and Gretel, is much more sympathetic. She does send the kids out to the woods, but it's only because they have a fight. And, and Hansel and Gretel were kind of asking for it a little bit. They, She's assigned them some chores. Gretel is supposed to be fixing some stockings, and Hansel's supposed to be making brooms. And when she comes home, she finds that they aren't doing either of those things. Instead, they're jumping around, singing, and dancing. And she gets really mad at them and yells at them. And in the, uh, in the argument they're having, the jug of milk, which is the only thing they have to eat in the house, gets spilled. And she's so mad that she sends them out into the woods to gather strawberries. The problem is that they go out in the woods and they get lost and they stay way too long and it gets dark. We're going to hear the first scene, the scene where brother and sister are jumping around and dancing and then the mother comes in and then we'll see both the mother's 
stern orders and then how the mother regrets what she's done, how she's lost her temper. It's just that they have nothing to eat and she doesn't know what to do. We're going to hear soprano Emily Albrink as Gretel, mezzo-soprano Sarah Mesco as Hansel, as the mother Maria Eugenia Antunes, and at the piano Artyom Krishayev.
Well, just after the mother wishes for help, uh, Hansel Gretel's father comes home, and he's got good news. He's a broom seller. He's been out selling brooms, and he's sold a lot of them. Uh, and he's come home with a big basket of food, and they're all set to celebrate when he asks, where are Hansel and Gretel? And he's shocked to find out that they've gone out into the woods because by now it's getting dark. And you know who comes out in the woods when it gets dark? The witch. And he sings uh, an aria about a witch and what she might do with a broomstick. We'll hear as Peter, the father, baritone Norman Garrett, and again as the mother, Maria Eugenia Antunes. Oh, no. 
Now, in all that time working with Wagner and all that time studying in German conservatories, Humperdinck picked up a lot of technique. He picked up the technique particularly, which was really important in German romantic music, of taking a small idea, a small, very simple idea, and building it into a big, big, big structure. I want to show you what I mean. Um, Artyom, could you play us the very beginning of the... Um, Father's aria, the theme of the witch. Perfect. Following the scene you just saw is the interlude that's called The Witch's Ride, where Humpertake takes that little idea and blows it up, changing from one key to another, bringing in all the instruments of the orchestra, playing it in high and low to create a big symphonic uh, poem, if you like, about the dance of witches, the ride of witches. Could we hear track two, please, Jesse? idea from a very simple thing, a very tiny little cell. Uh, and all the, the big themes in Hansel and Gretel are very, very simple little ideas. You can weave them together, just as Richard Wagner did in all his operas, or at least all his later operas, to create very complicated and interesting things with all sorts of changes of drama. So what happens after Hansel and Gretel get lost out in the woods? They get very frightened, 
as it gets dark, and they seem to see specters and spirits everywhere. Uh, but at the moment of their greatest terror, who should turn up but the Sandman? And the Sandman always turns up, of course, when it's time for kids to go to sleep. And he sprinkles a little magic dust in their eyes, and they suddenly get very sleepy. And they get ready to lie down um, to go to bed, but they remember that they ought to say their evening prayer before they go to sleep. And the evening prayer, of course, is one of the best known parts of Hansel and Gretel. We'll hear it again sung by Emily Albrink as Gretel and Sarah Meskel as Hansel. By the way, did you notice uh, that Hansel is not a boy? <laughs> Have you noticed? This is a, this is, there's a long tradition of having young boys, uh, boys uh, who are so young that their voices haven't changed, played by girls. It goes back, uh, those of you who know the marriage of Figaro remember the page Cherubino, for example, uh, in Mozart's opera, who uh, is supposed to be about 12, and he's always played by a mezzo-soprano. Um, and the same thing happens here. So here's the evening prayer from Hansel and Gretel. I want to show you some other things that Engelbert Humperdinck learned from Richard Wagner. One thing Wagner did really well is to take a theme and 
change it into an accompaniment. You would have a melody that you'd hear a character sing, and then you hear it later in the orchestra, changed a little bit, but still recalling the first time you heard it. Those kinds of themes uh, musicologists call leitmotifs. They're, they're sort of lighten meets to guide in German. And the leitmotif is a, a, a kind of theme that guides you through an opera. Every time you hear it, you think about the same character or the same event or the same object. Artem, could you play us the first two bars of the evening prayer? Now, in the scene we're going to see next, uh, Hansel and Gretel are waking up in the forest uh, after a good night's sleep, courtesy of the Sandman. And um, they remember that while they were asleep, exactly the thing that they talked about in their prayer happened. Fourteen angels came down to guard them as they were sleeping. Um, and when Gretel talks about that, um, where she begins to talk about her dream, we get this accompaniment. The, um, at underneath, um, underneath, I dreamt, I heard a murmuring and, and ringing in A flat. What the orchestra is doing, it's the same. Dee -da -da -dee -dee -da -dum, just changed into an accompaniment pattern. Play that for us once more, Artyom. It's subtle, but it's there. So when you hear that, you think back immediately. Uh, before she tells you what her dream was, you know kind of what it's going to be about because that's the music of the prayer and that's the music of the angels. There are parts of Hansel and Gretel that recall Wagner a little more directly. They're not actual quotes, but it's obvious that Humperdinck has absorbed a lot of Richard Wagner's language. I want to play you another excerpt from the scene we're about to hear. This is um, Hansel and Gretel waking up. Uh, Gretel uh, is singing like a lark, and Hansel is crowing like a rooster. Could we have track three, please, Jesse? Now, we said that uh, Humperdinck was Wagner's assistant on Parsifal, but that was not his first encounter with Wagner. That was his first encounter with Wagner in person. The first time he heard the music, really, is when he went away to school in Munich. Uh, he got there in, in uh, 1877. In 1878, he heard Wagner's great four-part uh, opera, The Ring of the Nibelungen, for the first time. Um, and he was so impressed that he went right out and joined a Wagner society called uh, the Orden vom Graal, that is the Order of the Holy Grail. Uh, and you can hear uh, in this excerpt from Valkyrie that he obviously remembered some of that music when he came to write Hansel and Gretel. Could we have track four, please?
it's very similar to the climax of Hansel's music, isn't it? You've got the big flourish with the brass, you've got the, the, the timpani thundering away, you've got the scales coming down in the orchestra. So I'm not saying it's a quote, but I'm not saying he copied. I'm only saying that obviously Wagner's musical language became a part of Humperdinck's musical language, as it did for most composers of his generation. You know, even the, um, the music at the beginning of, of the Father's Aria that we played you, the music that turns into the Witch's Ride, sounds an awful lot like the music that introduces the giants in Das Rheingold. So obviously he knew a good supernatural theme when he heard one. Let's go ahead then and hear the uh, waking up of Hansel and Gretel. Um, Gretel is, is actually woken, although she doesn't know it, by the Dew Fairy who comes around and sprinkles dew on you in the morning when it's time to get up. Um, and she wakes up and she hears the larks singing and she begins to sing along with them. Hansel uh, wakes up like a rooster. They recount to each other the dreams that they had during the night of the 14 angels and then suddenly they see something magical. A cottage in the woods, a cottage made of candy and cake. You notice that they're singing in English, um, and this is not just something we're doing this time at the Washington Opera. In fact, the first performances of Hansel and Gretel were in, in Great Britain were also in English. It was traditional at the time this opera was premiered, especially since it's an opera for families, to do it in the language of whatever place you were performing it in. Uh, and so English translations have been around since the 1890s. Uh, in fact, Hansel and Gretel was the first opera ever to be broadcast complete on the radio from Covent Garden in the 1920s. Anyway, here is the waking scene from Act Three of Hansel and Gretel. Once again, Emily Albrink as Gretel, Sarah Mesko as Hansel, Artyom Grishaev at the piano.
the Washington Opera will perform Hansel and Gretel in the Terrace Theatre from December 21st through the 23rd. Uh, we have a slight change in the program tonight. If you look in your printed program, uh, we were going to have the aria of the witch, but the witch was unfortunately unable to join us tonight. Um, something has come up. She has flown away. I don't know. The broom wasn't there in the parking spot. Anyway, you'll have to wait to see her for the actual performances, but we will, would like to make it up to you. Um, you know, we love opera. Not even opera singers can do only opera 24-7. Um, and we understand that not everybody can listen to opera 24-7 either. And so we would like to leave you with a special sort of holiday gift from the Washington National Opera, which is not opera, um, from bass Solomon Howard. Not the witch, but someone equally crunchy, let's say. Uh, based Solomon Howard, pianist Archom Grishayev. describe you are, and I quote, steak, steak, steak. Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Thank you to our performers, and we look forward to seeing you at the opera. <laughs>